Good evening, my name is Cecilia Escamilla Greenwald, and I'm your host for Students Speak Out. Joining me today in the studio are two high school seniors from Davis Senior High School. We have with us today Babajide Olupona and Waimi Rosas Romero. Thank you both for joining us here in the studio today. Babajide Olupona is a Friendship Day facilitator, uh, alternate youth commissioner to the City of Davis Human Relations Commission, a health advocate and one of his uh, 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 most successful and I know makes him very proud, he's uh, a football player number 73 on the Davis Senior High School Blue Devils. I believe you're a, a center and defensive tackle, right? Yes. A DT as you call it. Dwaimi Rosas Romero is a student representative to the school board and a Friendship Day facilitator as well. Thank you both very much for joining us here in the studio today. Um, let's get started and uh, talk first about February 24th. You were both in attendance at that, at that forum. Uh, hosted by the Human Relations Commission of the City of Davis. And the forum focused on um, solutions to a community problem of um, uh, racism, bullying, et cetera, that is going on in the community and in schools. There were a lot of people in attendance who said that they were shocked, surprised, or just did not know of some of the incidents that students were talking about that day. Um, for what reason do you feel people did not know that it was as bad as it was? Who do you want to talk? Anybody, either of you. Um, well, I think <clears> there <throat> could be several, there are several reasons why people in general don't know why, what, what's going on and if it's going on at all. I think one of the major issues is like, since we've been growing up, Davis has just gets this idea of this sheltered place that it's kind of like the perfect community where nothing happens. And I think that there are a lot of people who just live their lives who don't have to deal with this on a daily basis and come to a point where they just don't think it goes on because they don't see it happening. I think when it comes to administration or the city not knowing about it, there's also several reasons why they wouldn't know about it also. There's a large, like, there's a large number of students who don't report things just for the simple fact that it's just going to lead to escalating of issues and the whole silent of the code of not reporting things to the offices. That's a big thing that goes on in all high schools. And then at the same time, it's their students who also don't feel that the administration is going to help them out and is going to give them support. So they also don't go to the administration. And for the combination of all these reasons, it just adds and then eventually just comes to a point where there's just a large number of people who don't know what's going on. Okay. Uh Dwayne, you mentioned earlier when we were talking about this uh, before the show, you mentioned uh, kind of what Baba Jide has mentioned, the code of silence, so to speak. And I asked you, is that code of silence um, um, from students to students or from students to administrators? It's definitely from students to students, just because um, you don't want people to think that you're just going um, to your mom and crying to them and telling them, what people are doing to you at school, because you, you, you want to deal things on your own. And um, it, it's really hard, but at, during that time, you really want your, all your other friends to not put you down. But it's, I don't know how to explain it. It's just hard. You, you, if you go to a teacher, it makes you look like you're the weak one. Like You can't deal with it. So is it correct then to say almost, um as a means of survival, living, being on that campus day in, day out, you have to have coping mechanisms, and that's one of them yeah. to to yes. uh, definitely uh, to, to be a part of this code of silence, so that you can not be singled out or isolated. Exactly. Is that yes. Right. So. What, if anything, do you think can be done? Either of you think can be done to create an atmosphere that makes it okay for students to bring their concerns to their parents, to teachers, to administrators, without there being some kind of ramification by fellow students. What do you think it would take to create that kind of atmosphere? Do, uh, do you have any ideas? Well, I think what we're doing right now is just bringing awareness to school because 
maybe people like I know when I went through the whole like a person bothering me like I was being bullied in um, junior high that I just felt like it was only happening to me mm -hmm. and maybe there were I didn't know that there were other people going through the same thing so if more people are aware that other people are going through it and that there is something that can be done I mean of course I, I would have done something about it before and it's hard because at the time you feel like everybody's against you mm -hmm. so it's like you're the only one who is experiencing this yeah and there's really nothing to no one to turn to because in my uh, situation this girl made all my friends just completely ignore me mm -hmm. she told them not to talk to me just because she didn't like me and it just I mean I didn't know what to do I could not go to I didn't want to go to my parents I didn't want to go to school and I had no friends so it's just it's really it's really hard it was difficult being isolated and, yeah. and you didn't want to to face that again yeah and it's kind of like you just have to meet new people and mm -hmm. hope that they'll accept you for who you are and just eventually build up from there and I think yeah definitely just bringing awareness to what's going on and maybe if students didn't necessarily have to go straight to counselors like for example if they had like a box I mean, mm -hmm. something simple as a box where you could just write things like, there's this problem happening to me, so the administration will be on the lookout of this person. Uh -huh. And not necessarily say, okay, this is me, this is happening to me, but mm -hmm. just to say something, this person's been bothering me. And that way it's not such a thing that they feel like they're actually um, how can, snitching on the person yeah, yeah. in a way. So, so for example, you could then let them know that this problem exists but then they wouldn't necessarily say that you were the one who snitched on this person or exactly. who pulled on them. Uh -huh. So you would feel, you would have more anonymity. Yeah, yeah. this is particularly more in junior high. Uh -huh. But then when you're older, you, I mean, it's kind of different. I, I haven't really experienced anything like that in the high school, but it was mainly junior high. Uh, Baba Jide, what about you? I think that's that's a brilliant idea. Actually. It is a brilliant <laughs> idea. I, I I love the fact that we're having this discussion right now, and I know we're going to have some more because I think this is how we're going to develop solutions to some of these problems that you all have been uh, encountering. What what would you suggest? I would say you? like at the especially at the at the junior high level, I think the box idea is just pretty much brilliant because especially with males, I'm mm -hmm. talking from my own perspective. Guys will not. It's just it's just anti yes, everything that a guy is like the that society or like other fellow students tell you to be and you will not go in and just go report things that happen. That's why when fights happen is because most of the time they, the principals didn't even hear about if these people have been problems before because they just guys just don't go in. It just doesn't happen. It's just like the male code of conduct. Yeah, they just, it's just don't do it. It's just one of those things. I think the and I think personally I the idea that of trying to create an atmosphere in which students will be comfortable enough to go to the talk to the principals and not worry about what other students is, is go, are going to feel and what they're going to say is just it's not going to happen mm -hmm. just, you can't think like that it just that's it's there's a certain way that the student life works and it's the way that it's probably always going to work in the future and the way it's always been done and that's just one of the things that isn't done people just don't like to tell other people and, and go tell the administration their problem i think for that issue, a better way to look at it is in, to make students themselves like more in strengthened or empowered to tell their friends, hey, don't do that to this person, or hey, don't say that to this person. That, I believe, is a lot more realistic than trying to get students to want to go talk to the administration. I think it's easier for a student to stand up to their friend than it is for a student to go talk to the administration and then fear more escalating the issue in a way. What do you think um, could be done to help students or assist students in in that process in helping them or teaching them skills to be able to stand up to those that are harassing them or bothering them what what do you think could be done <clears throat> i think part of a large part of it is especially with because we're both freshman day facilitators and this is something we talk about at almost and we'll be talking day. about friendship day by the way yeah um i think a big part of it is Letting, when other students really understand or hear the stories of other students that they know, people they see on a daily basis, people they've, they've known for years, and they really understand the extent of the pain or the things they've gone through, it makes 
standing up to your friend a lot easier, you know, okay. in a way. I, it's really hard for me to, to think of ways in which you could just make a random person want to stand up for, for civil rights or stand up for the rights of others. But it's when people, I think it's human nature and in, in everyone, there's just that good side, the side that you'll feel, you'll feel, you'll feel the pain of the other person. And when you hear the stories of some of the people at our high school, you're just like, you can't help but be like, hey, like this has I to I didn't stop. know that that person was going through yeah. this, that exactly. was experiencing exactly. that. So I'm going to stand up for him and her exactly. because this has to stop. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. Okay, yes. okay. So creating an atmosphere where these things can be discussed and uh, students can, can use their, their natural, uh, uh, what would you call it, I guess, uh, natural tendency to be uh, compassionate and caring for their fellow students. Is that yeah. basically what you're saying? Okay. Um, let's let's go back to uh, the Friendship Day facilitator. Um, you are both Friendship Day facilitators. Mm -hmm. What is Friendship Day, and what does a Friendship Day facilitator do? What is the role of a Friendship Day facilitator? What is Friendship Day? <laughs> I always do the history of Friendship Day. So I'm, I got well, let's one. start with the history. Of yeah, um, it's a history. good place to start. It started, I believe it was on May 18th, 1983, that okay. Tong Nguyen was killed on the day of yes, school campus. Yes, that is correct. And after Tong Nguyen's death, it, he was, to tell you what happened, Tong Nguyen was a Vietnamese student who was stabbed to death on the, student, on the campus. On the campus, right. Because of racially motive, motivated incidents. And after that it happened, it was kind of a shock to the community yeah, as yes. a whole. And they decided to try to create activities and programs to kind of try to strengthen the bonds of the community. And Friendship Day was one of the ideas they came up with. And pretty much students just come to Friendship Day. We invite a large variety of students. And then they, it gives them a chance to, to know people that they wouldn't get to know in the school environment. It express, it's good that we take them out of the school environment. And like the first thing we do is play Duck, Duck, Goose. And it just breaks down all the boundaries and kind of like the whole, this is my image at school. And when people get more on a personal level, and you get to meet people, every single freshman day I meet people that I've never met before, or people that I've seen and I've, like, I've seen for like years and years and I've never just, I always learn new things about them. And it pretty much just gets students together and brings them outside of school and breaks down all the boundaries and just lets people see people for what, who they really are, is just the person they are, not the stereotype that is given to them in the high school environment. So so on Friendship Day then, um, how does it work? Are you broken into different groups? Um, and, and then you go out into the community? Is that is that how it is set up? No, what we do is we invite different students from the high school. Okay. They get an invitation and we, go, we uh, have a Friendship Day in the 3rd and B. Mm -hmm. It's on a Friday and um, we pretty much do activities all together, but we do have small discussion groups. Okay. We have to, and that we do divide into groups. And it's just, we kind of just talk about different things such as discrimination, just prejudice, anything that's going on at the same, at the time, any stereotypes or things like that. We just, so that's how you meet students that you otherwise would not uh, normally have a lot of interaction with, perhaps, mm -hmm. yeah. is that right? And uh, so this has been going on since uh, since uh, 1983, yeah. I believe it is. Yes, yes, yes 1983. Um, what are some of the um, highlights of Friendship Day that you so have fun. have seen that that stand out the most in your mind? <laughs> I mean, it's hard to say because everything's so fun. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think. When I went, I wasn't a facilitator, but I was invited to Friendship Day. The thing I loved the most, like for example, in, in the introductions you get kind of, you get to see, like when you get to introduce another person that you don't know. So you talk, you, you're given a certain time and you have to find out as much as you can about that person. And it was interesting to find that some things that this person liked, I liked too. And I would never have thought that we had the same interests or things like that. And then also just enjoying the like spending time with those people you never even thought about talking at school mm -hmm. and having so much fun with that. And then when you go into the small discussion groups, hearing their stories and things that you can relate to. And by the time I left, I had a totally new like perspective of what was the high school. Because I, I began to see people for who they were instead of the stereotype and just believing it. 
Did you guys find that after Friendship Day that you went back to the high schools and had conversations or developed friendships with students that you might have otherwise not um, had discussions with or become friends with? Definitely. Did you both find yeah. that? It's, yeah. It's, it's, well, that's one of the biggest ideas that's incorporated in Friendship Day is we actually always at the end of it, we always have a talk of what you're going to do on Monday. And mm -hmm. we watch The Breakfast Club. Mm -hmm. And that's that's one of the highlights. I think it's, it's a, great a small movie, discussion huh? group after the scene from Breakfast Club is probably, is always the highlight. It's probably the best part for me because then it's, that's when, you know, because Friendship Day, there's a lot of just fun stuff and it's like, and it's fun, but that's when it gets, it just comes down to more of the, and the issue is just laid out. The issue of, you know, because if you know Friendship Day, right. I mean, mm -hmm. not Friendship Day, but Breakfast Club. Yes. It's a movie where kids, they're pretty much, I think it was five or six, six kids. Yeah, six. Six, I think. Yeah, six kids from completely different groups. You might not be able to tell, but I am older than you, so I did see it when I was in high school, believe it or not. Was it high school? Yes, I did. Yeah. <laughs> so it's pretty much six kids who from absolutely completely different groups, and they're put in an environment, and then it's just like the interaction between the kids, and it's just kind of like a small example of what high school life is all about yeah. is people from different groups coming together and when that issue is simplified just hearing people's opinions on it and the way people feel about it and then it always leads on to other issues it's just pretty much getting other people's opinions and seeing where they stand and what they believe in and things that have happened to them is always the best part it's because pretty much that's when it becomes on a personal level in Frederick there and, and you I realize how much you have in common instead exactly. of how different you yes, are that's what's exactly. so amazing huh that's yeah. what's quite amazing. There's like something that really sticks in my mind when I think about Friendship Day. Is there's, I don't remember what's the girl's name, the one that was rich or something? Molly Ringwald. Well, her, there's this thing that she says. Um, she says, I have as much feelings as you do, and it hurts as much as when everyone steps, when everybody all steps, all over, steps all over you. And that just really stuck to me because, I mean, I think, oh, yeah, like the thing that the people think, the preppy crowd or something. And that you wouldn't think that they would get harmed by anything, that they're just happy with their lives. And just that part just stuck with me. And I just thought, wow, you know, uh -huh, uh -huh. those are those kind of things that you just realize. And you think that, that they're not affected by anything negative because their life seems so perfect. And, mm -hmm. and you realize that they, they have emotions and feelings also. Wow, well, it definitely sounds like something very, very positive. Um, after uh, February 24th, that forum on the 24th, um, I've spoken both to to um, to students, to you, Baba Jide, and uh, we've had discussions with the superintendent of uh, of schools, Dave Murphy. And it's my understanding that a lot of things have been happening on campus. Um, if I'd like to talk about some of those things, I know that there have been uh, a weekly, I don't know if you call them rallies or meetings where there have been quite a number of students in attendance. Um, can you tell us a bit about those? Well, mainly BJ is the one kind of <laughs> in charge of that. And it's just a student forum. We all kind of share like our thoughts about the school climate, mm -hmm. about anything that's been happening. I, I've only been able to attend one. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it's just pretty much um, people. I mean, it's not only listening to the people who are actually experiencing the prejudice themselves, but just people who, who are blamed for it are able to, to talk about it and say, you know, this is why I do this, or please let me know what I'm doing wrong to. Because I don't think, I, I do believe that there are certain people that are just blamed and maybe they're doing things because they're, they're not really aware of what the impact of their words can do. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. I mean, just the whole bringing awareness is helping out a lot of our students. Papa Jude, what, um, what helped you to think of this idea and how, well, first of all, how, how did you think of this idea and how did you make it happen? Well, pretty much it, after the whole, this, all these incidents had gone on, me and my group of friends in a way had kind of separated ourselves from a lot of people mm -hmm. and even people that I've known for years. Like we just, it was kind of a point where it was so many people that we'd known that we'd been friends with had been doing things that we were just like, well, we trust each other, so we're going to stick with each other. And then I just, I realized that there had been adults that talked about it, we talked, we'd, all, we'd been up to all these forums and talked about it, and there'd never been a time where students just discussed just the students. issue. Just students. <laughs> just students talked about it. So I was like, well, 
um, I wonder if people would be interested. And I asked a couple of people, and they were like, well, that'd be cool. And then I went to Mark Hicks to talk about it. <laughs> and then we pretty much The planned infamous it. Mark Hicks. <laughs> yeah. So then we pretty much, we just got the plan together. We got a room. I got it um, cleared by the administration. And then it was, it was the first one was really amazing. A lot of people came out, came to the place and we talked about the issue. And there had been, it's like, it's kind of a, a good and bad because a lot of people are just, I have the opinion that it's been overkill mm -hmm. and that everyone keeps talking about the issue. And a lot of people are like, well, people just come and talk about this is the problem, this is the problem, how do we solve it? How do we solve it? But for me, it's the, this, the sessions, no matter what people say, like the impact that it's had on me personally, I think it was worth having because after the very first meeting, um, there were a lot, there were people from all groups and there were people from the group of the, the people that had been talking at the basketball games that had been in the papers and stuff and they were trying to express their opinion. The ones that have been sort of, mm, for lack yeah. of a better way to say it, um, um, saying certain things yeah. and not, and that have caused harm to others. Yeah, those and people. It was, it was amazing that they, people like try to really express their opinion and some people got really attacked for it. Mm -hmm. And I, that was kind of like, whoa, because it was kind of like tables were turned and it was majority became minority and minority became majority. Okay. And so it was kind of like, it's been kind of an interesting thing to happen, but what happened, the interesting thing was, after the very first meeting, um, what, a sophomore baseball player came up to talk to me. Mm -hmm. And he's just, everyone knows him, he talks, he's also always talking about basketball games and stuff. And he really, he simplified something that no one really has been able to simplify for me. And he said, from him personally, when he went to the basketball games, every single game, when he went to the game and he was gonna talk, and he was going to say stuff. He thought of things that would get in the heads of the players. And that was the opinion, or that was the way in which the crowd is seeing it. They're chanting and they're saying all these things to get in the head of the players. And that's their opinion they're, they're coming from. And, but then I was trying to explain to him, it was that although the things that were said were said from this angle and right. for this purpose, you can't see it as anything but racist. Right. Because the things that were said to Fairfield players will not be said to... You know, Nevada Union players, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, it's and the, every all almost all the comments that were made were were perpetuating a stereotype. Right. But at the same time, just hearing it, like it caught me off guard because I never thought about it like that. Mm -hmm. That they, so instead they, of making a comment, let's say, um, you know, uh, you're a terrible player, <laughs> whatever. You know, uh, commenting on the player's ability, they were commenting on their ethnicity perhaps or something relating to their ethnicity or trying to find something about them that they perceived as being um, um, negative but it wasn't just about their playing it was more more um, of a personal attack and is yes that? yes and no because uh -huh. this is ever since i've been really talking to these people i've come to an interesting like standpoint on this topic i see both sides really okay and i understand both sides in defense to the crowd what they say is said from this point, like they're just really, when they really think, I think a large majority of them see it as they're saying it to get in the heads of the players okay. and just to get them out of the game. And, and just to frustrate in them so it messes to them, up their game. On that Fairfield game, they really did get in the head of the best player of the team. He got ejected from the game because oh, he just okay. can't handle it. But at the same time, it's you have to be really careful about what you say. Right. Because I personally wasn't at that game. But if I was at that game, the whole food stamps, you know, don't buy doesn't buy Hummers or, or like GPA and stuff would bother me. Right. And it's, it, it hasn't really changed from, from my sister's years. It was, we go to Stanford, you go to jail. That was yeah. what was said. And yeah. it's just, it's pretty much changing. So they have to understand the, um, the ramifications of their comments. Pretty much. How, that's, yeah, they that's do. They have to take some responsibility. And I don't know because I wasn't there and I don't know these, these people, but um, I believe there comes a point, it sounds like you're saying, where people have to take responsibility for their words and for their actions. Is, yes. that, is that right? I think it's just ignorance is mm -hmm. just the... It, I know it's like I've told people what you said was just ignorant and the people get defensive. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's just it, that is what it is. It is just ignorance in the simplest form. So having these forums on campus, has it helped to, to, um, to discuss this and what impact these things, these words that are being said, what impact it has and how it affects the people that it is being said to. Have you guys been able to have those discussions? Yeah, I think yeah. it's it, it pretty much, it's been great to mm -hmm, me. Mm -hmm. And people just get a chance to tell their stories, say their side, and people get to see people 
for on the human level. Yeah. And it's I personally don't know if they're going to continue mm -hmm. because I think once students lose interest, then it's going to be gone. But that's why it's so important to keep that's why the dialogue mm -hmm. going. But it's. It's so far, it's been really good, and I'm hoping it continues. But I guess a lot of people are coming to the point where it's like, "Hey, we know the problem is out there. Hey, we know it exists. What can we do to solve it?" And it's it's that's the next step in the thing, and that's the next step where we're trying to take it is we have to try to figure out ways to get students together, talking about ways to solve the problem rather than just telling, saying what the problem is. Okay. Well, you mentioned a very interesting thing that I'd like to to touch base on, and that is. Um, solving the problem. What are some of your suggestions for solving the problem? Have you given thought to that? Have you heard students express opinions on how to solve the problem? I love your idea about the the, the box, suggestion box. Uh, we're going to have to definitely pass that on to Superintendent Murphy. It's a great idea because it does provide some anonymity. Uh, what are some other suggestions that you think might work at the high school? I think there should also, I mean, Friendship Day in itself helps it sounds, out a lot. It sounds like so a if there day. could be any more programs at the high school that could be almost like Friendship Day, but just a, a place where people are just able to talk about, I mean, I know there's the whole program with peer helpers that you know you can go with another student and talk to them, but not necessarily. People might not feel comfortable going to a person they have never met in their entire lives mm -hmm. and just tell them their problems. Right. So, I mean, that's kind of hard. So, I mean, I'm not sure how would you get people to, to, to open up. Open up. It's, it's really about. hard. I mean, I'm just thinking right now junior high, but I mean, in high school, I think it's a little bit different. Depends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think the whole bringing awareness to everything is just very important. Do you think if there was more opportunity similar to Friendship Day or maybe even more Friendship Days that that would help? Yeah, definitely. Help. Okay. Have you uh, thought of any Babaji Day or have you I've, heard I've, of any suggestions? <laughs> yeah, I've had to feel this question a couple of times and I was just answering it earlier today. Um, there are different ways, there are several different steps that you, you can take as students and as administration to solve the problem. I think you got to kind of take it differently. As students, the, the way I see the problem stopping or at least decreasing is students taking social responsibility for what's going on mm -hmm. and for what happens at the, at the campus. Okay. When a student stand up to others and say, hey, I don't want to hear that, or hey, I don't want to hear you say that, then that's going to eventually help the problem lessen and lessen, and that's a very big part. I think also uh, a lack of education of other cultures is it stifles diversity. Definitely. Because, you know, for like, for Black, Black History Month, you know, for at the high school, all it is is, is posters in the library and this one wall that, and like, that's all it that's is. That's it. Um, Cinco de Mayo, everything. All the, all the, all the parts of other cultures, all the richness and, and diversity that exists at the high school isn't celebrated in the curriculum. Uh -huh. It's, we say it all the time, you know, that the United States is a salad bowl or a melting pot, depending on which way you see it, and that hey, there's all these different cultures, that California is becoming more diverse, that the Davis High School is becoming more diverse, yet at the same time, the curriculum isn't changing, and the, the, the diversity that is existing and the diversity that is growing, it doesn't seem, isn't being celebrated, it's not being shown that, that it's a different group of people that's, that's, being taught, that's being taught the information. You never hear really about it's very rare to hear about you know like the history of other cultures or what goes on in other cultures but there's some teachers who personally take it upon themselves to step <coughs> excuse me mm -hmm. to like to incorporate social issues in their classes mm -hmm. and it's i think there needs to be more of that because if you don't if you're not educated about other cultures you're going to get the education from different people from different places, and the big thing is TV. TV, because, you know, <laughs> yeah. the news. When everybody is uh, committing crimes, they they show on the news, and unfortunately, they'll show you know people, uh, Caucasian people. They'll show people of other ethnicities, and and people then develop these stereotypes and thinks that it thinks that that the majority of those people that are committing the crimes are uh, minority groups. Is that? And so you're saying people are buying into that too much yeah, what they see on TV. It's something we that we talked about actually one of the small discussion groups is like especially with, with for me personally it's the whole African issue mm -hmm. and when you see the depiction of TV on Africa uh, like of Africa on TV 
it's people in huts or people who are poor. They never really show the richness yes. of the country. And then, so when you come here, the whole idea that, hey, you're a Bushman, did you live in a hut? It's yeah, That's geez. all they've seen. And then, you You've know. You've heard those comments oh. before? Oh. <laughs> You'd be surprised for the last oh, 12 geez, years. Geez. And, <laughs> you know, rap music and rap culture, it's a, it's, a, it's a culture now. Right. And that's also another thing. And all the stereotypes of that are, are put on African Americans who go to the Davis High School and they're in the Davis High School system because that's all people see on TV. They're not educated about the other things in culture. They're not educated about the strengths and the diversity and the richness of everything, mm -hmm. of like different aspects of culture. Like in the Nigerian culture itself is so rich. There's so many different parts of it that like so many people are so amazed when they hear the things. And I hear and I, I tell them the stories and the beliefs and the way the culture is based on. And it's amazing. People are really interested. And I think that if they had more of that incorporated, or even if they just came up with a class mm -hmm. that just talked about diversities of other cultures, you'd be surprised at the amount of students that would sign up for it. I wow. think it would be amazing. Just that, to, I think it would be an experiment. You know, Just have the school board maybe just come up with a class. And I don't know how hard that is, but if they just came up with a class that just talked about diversity of other cultures mm -hmm. and just talked about other cultures other than the basic one of the American culture that we're, t we're taught from first grade to 12th, you know, if they, they focused on other cultures and they focused on diversity, I think you'd be amazed on the amount of people that'd be interested and would really want to know. That is an excellent suggestion. And uh, since we are meeting with Superintendent Murphy, we will definitely uh, uh, suggest to him the, the different suggestions that you both are coming up with. You, know, you face this day in, day out, and you have fabulous suggestions. And uh, we do hope to hear from fellow students as well. Um, so what you're saying, uh, Baba Jide, is that that not only did you say that students would most likely take the class, that mm -hmm. there would be a lot of interest, but you're saying that a lot of, um, of these stereotypes stem from the ignorance or lack of knowledge that people have about Definitely. other cultures, right? Definitely. Right. Yeah, like, I have to say, like, there's, um, now in my point of view of, over Hispanics, like, um, I don't know if you heard about the magazine Vanity Fair. Mm -hmm. Did you hear about what happened? I did, yes. That was just, uh, oh, it was, it was, uh, it was unfortunate. It was very shocking. Why don't you, why don't you uh, tell us, Thwami, what, what <laughs> happened? Because a lot of people don't know about it. Well, um, it was a letter and to this character in the magazine, you know, that you asked them questions. Almost like a, a, a Dear Ann Landers well, type yeah. of yeah. Uh, so they were just asking something about the Spanish language, like mm -hmm. speaking Spanish, that this person, I'm not really sure what it was, it was something about this person wanted to know why people were, like why girls would like Spanish or something mm -hmm. like that, like the language, I guess. Mm -hmm. But anyways, the the response to this person was that, why, why would you want to learn Spanish if it's only spoken by ignorant people mm -hmm. who only clean houses and you know are in you know just fast food place and yeah. who are just completely don't know anything. They're not educated. This is a this is a magazine, a national magazine Vanity that Fair? yeah, Vanity Fair. Yeah, and it, it was quite shocking and surprising. Exactly. I looked into it myself. I thought, is this true? Did this really happen? And I I myself wrote a letter to them. Yeah, uh, that I yeah, was I was so, I was very um, upset. But you're using that as an example. So what you're saying is that that is a part <clears> of. Uh, uh, the problem is that, that mainstream America, exactly. uh, this is happening in mainstream America, and kids see this and they think it's okay and that it's acceptable. They buy into the stereotypes. Yeah, and I think the, the sad thing is that both the Hispanics and the other ethnicities buy into this stereotype. Mm -hmm. Both, I say, because um, people just think that, well, there's a large number of Hispanics uh, I mean, Hispanics, uh, particularly uh, Mexicans, who come here to work on um, in the fields. Right. Oh, they work on. My family did, as a matter of fact. Yeah. Yes, yes. I have family who does too. Right. And yeah, there's a lot of people who come here because because they don't have enough like a job opportunities in Mexico, mm -hmm. which is really bad. Like it's really sad. But the sad thing is that people don't see the other side of the Mexicans. Like, for example, there's a lot of professionals over there, Nobel Prize winners. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's 
there's a lot of things that people are just not aware of. And the reason why they don't come over here, it's because they're successful over there. Mm -hmm. And people don't really see that. They just think Mexico as just this type of people and that's how they're supposed to stay. And also, if I might add to that, is that the people that do uh, work in the service industry or do work um, in, on the farms, uh, in field work, there's nothing wrong with that. Exactly. It is work that they do very well. It is work that they are proud of. Um, California uh, uh, would not be the wealthy state that it is if we did not have the, uh, uh, the labor, the dedicated labor of farm workers. That is why Cesar Chavez, if I could do a plug here, exactly. <laughs> we're going to be celebrating Cesar Chavez Day on the 29th of uh, uh, March. And so so what you're saying is that not only do we have the farm workers, but we also have professionals in the uh, Mexican community who, who choose not to come here, and those that are here, it was just students need to be exposed to that. Yeah, that there's a variety. Be, there's of, a variety, uh, and also to uh, have respect, like you say, for the farm workers. Mm -hmm. There's nothing degrading about working in a, in the fields. No, they're not being at all. honest. They're honest people who are earning their money. Are working very, very Extremely hard. Extremely hard. hard. Yes. I mean, I know people who just work plenty of hours. Oh, from five in the morning till uh, yeah, yeah. It's, after it's, it's amazing. I just don't know how can they stand that. And yeah. it's really hot, like in the summer. Yeah. I mean, I just can't believe how much, how hard it is and how they're just almost treated as if they were not as good as certain people, you know? Right, right. And that's what I'm saying. Also, it affects the Hispanic community because some people may even feel like that they, they feel less than others. Mm -hmm. Because I know, for example, like I, I can say my mom, she has this problem, like she, she doesn't really want to speak English because she thinks she's going to be make fun of or that she doesn't have the education supposedly to. She feels like any. she's going to be made fun of by her um, uh, family or siblings or by friends. May, well, for example, her accent and okay. things like that. Uh -huh. And... I mean, my mom's a lawyer and everything, wow. but in here, she can't really do anything because it's different laws, obviously. Oh, I see. But in Mexico, she's a practicing lawyer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, she, she feels almost as if the ca Caucasians look down on her. Mm -hmm. And I, I just don't understand why she does. And it's just hard because she just looks at, she, she thinks that the stereotype here of the Mexicans are just people who have no education and they don't really have a voice. Mm -hmm. That's how my mom feels. And I've told her many of times that, I mean, that's not it. You can do whatever you want. Oh, yeah. yeah. And it's obvious. I mean, of course, in here, I feel like I have an even a greater opportunity in succeeding than if I would in Mexico. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, like, for example, like students at the high school, they, it's so runny. It's like they're, they even think that what they're expected to do is just go community college, and then go to work, maybe just anything easy, like fast food place, anything like that. And they don't really think ahead. And it's just the thing is that they don't have the role models to be like shown to them saying, OK, this is what you can become. It's OK to want to be that person. And these are the Hispanic or Mexican students at the high yeah. school. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So you're saying um, if more opportunities were presented to them yeah. um, about uh, uh, showing them um, uh, Hispanics that, that have careers in different areas, that, that they would see that it's something that they too could achieve. Is yeah. that what you're suggesting? Because, yeah. I mean, even like in school, like it's really hard to find somebody who's uh, Hispanic uh, involved in like sports, or in clubs, or in student government, or in like Friendship Day. Mm -hmm. I mean, my friends, when I try to join Friendship Day, they were like, okay, why are you gonna do that? <laughs> you know, it's like, why are you joining all those things? And like, all my friends, well, the friends I used to have, when I said I wanted to do student government, and they would be, well, why would you wanna be there? It's just all the white people. Oh. So they don't feel very welcomed either. Exactly, they I don't see. feel welcomed. Mm -hmm. And that's why there's some, uh, Mexicans that just tend to stick together and they feel like okay we are we all that's all we have each other mm -hmm. and that's it and the like they call the white people or any yeah. they won't even try to even listen to us so what's 
What's the point of, of trying? Because it's not going to make a difference. You make a very good point, and I'd like to ask you both this, this question as a follow-up to what we've been discussing. One of the items that was mentioned at the forum on February 24th is um, the, that students would like to look at ways or come up with ways to put an end to or hopefully put a limit on student self-segregation. And that's basically what you've been talking about. What suggestions do you have, if any, for that? How can, what, what can be done to, to um, put an end to or put a limit to student self-segregation? I mean, students are obviously going to hang out with whomever they choose to hang out with, and especially if, if there are situations where they're being shunned or where they're being um, um, treated negatively because of their race, ethnicity, gender, um, um, socioeconomic status, etc. They're going to stick to others who are more like them. What do you think can be done to curtail that? Do you have any ideas for that? Um, in a way, this question has been asked a lot. The idea that there are clubs where it's it's like you know the BSU mm -hmm. and the Gay Straight Alliance and I don't know how is it was is Latinos Unidos. Latinos mm -hmm. Unidos mm -hmm. and there's all these clubs that. And the question of, oh, well, aren't these clubs promoting segregation or whatever? Um, I think, in my personal opinion, it's, it, it kind of happens, you know. All the, the, all the friends that I'm friends with now, in junior high, I wasn't friends with at all. I've almost gone to fights with probably all four of my closest black friends. Okay. And it just happens. Like, I didn't personally say, hey, well, oh, I'm not going to be friends. Oh, I'm just going to be friends with the black guys. And it's just something that happens, you know, when you are in a mm. school of... You know, 20, 20 something, like how many students are there? 2,000 something? 2,000. A little over 2,000? Yeah. Okay. When, there's, when, you're in the, when you're in a school with 2,000 something students and you're one of, you know, maybe 50 or 20 black people that are there, I could probably wow. say about 50. What, what do you expect? Mm -hmm. Like, it's, it's just, it's going to happen. People are generally more comfortable with people of their own kind. Like, I think it would be funny to see, like, I, this would be interesting. Some of these people who come up with, with this question that why do these clubs exist or why do, do people segregate themselves, it would be funny just to take them, uproot them up, and put them in a, a school where they're the, the minority. Grant, for instance, or Johnson, a school that maybe, like even, or... And see if and they see would... if they <laughs> would also cling with people of their own kind. And it's, it's for us, me and my friends, we're friends with probably, eventually, if you... We're friends with almost everyone in the school, if okay. you look at it. Uh -huh. We we know people from every a lot of the groups, if not every single group. I have friends I can say from every, almost every single group in high school. So I don't feel that I'm segregating myself from another group because my closest friends are just all happen to be black. It's also we all just all happen to play sports, and a lot of we live next to each other. Two of my friends have the exact same birthday. And it's just like <laughs> pe it's just they they're the people that 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 stuck by me over the years. Right. And if they, if some of them were white, it'd be the exact same thing. Okay. I have a lot of really, really close friends that are white. And so I personally don't even think that you can really say, hey, why did these things happen? But at the same time, it's, there are cliques at the high school. Mm -hmm. And when group, when people feel, you know, if these, a, a way to put it is, if these people weren't friends with each other, who would they be friends with in a way? Okay. Because do I believe that a lot of groups are not really not welcomed by other groups? A lot of times, you know, they're not talked to. And personally, a problem that I've seen is between like, like um, the Mexican Americans and the African Americans. There's a big issue, especially with the younger kids. Like with, with our grade, it, wasn't, it hasn't been that big a problem with the seniors. But with the juniors and sophomores, there's been a lot of tension. And a lot like, of tension between the African Americans and, and Mexican students. Yeah, and oh. it's it's kind of like it's absurd to me. And yeah. one of the things that I want to do before this year is over is talk to them and get them to work their things out because it's when there's all these minorities in the high school <laughs> that are all minorities that are all going to suffer through the same things and they're all going to go through the same experiences. It is ridiculous to be fighting with one another. Right. And I think mm -hmm. 
you know, it just... It's amazing to hear you say this. I'm laughing because this is something that is often discussed in quote-unquote the real world, the adult world, and here you are as youth and you're experiencing this at high school and you're already saying, wait a minute, this needs to stop and we need to come together and talk about this, basically coalition building, so to speak, and so that's that's wonderful. You, I, I commend you guys because you're... Uh, you're uh, developing your leadership skills and you're recognizing that this problem exists. So what, what, what would you suggest? What would be a way to, to deal with this perhaps? I think, you know, communication is a big deal. And, you know, there are so many stereotypes mm -hmm. about, you know, about different cultures. Everyone has them. Everyone has them, you know. And in a way, you just got to realize, well, that's not really, they don't exist. You know, mm -hmm. like for me, it's personally, I've grown up with so many people from different cultures that, you know, like, like, I call him Boo, but Jose Garibay is one of my best friends in the world. Like, I've known him since the sixth grade. We play football together. And it's just like, he's like as close to friends with me as some of my black friends. Uh -huh. And it's just that, it's just with the seniors, I don't know if it's just our class, but there hasn't been a lot of really Mexican American, African American issues with mm -hmm. our, with us. With, but with the younger kids, you know, a thing that's happened is a lot of the kids that are here now, especially the black males, they, were, they didn't grow up in Davis all their lives. Okay. A lot of kids moved here from other places. And I think one of the one of the things we've talked about and the warnings we've given the administration is when we leave, the group of kids that are going to be there are completely different group of guys. And the, some of the stuff that we've gone through, they will not take. Okay. So in other words, the tensions are such yeah. that they may escalate to a level that is not good. Yes. Yeah. I, I think commu communication is always, it, everyone says that communication is the best thing, but when you actually go up and talk to someone, it's... And you realize, wait a second, you know, this person's really not quite the image that I thought they were. It's just completely different. Mm -hmm. And it's just when, when you, I think that's probably one of the best ways. And to someone, you know, I'm kind of frustrated with the question of, <laughs> hey, you, why do people segregate each other or segregate? It's because it's people are uncomfortable with the idea that, hey, there are the black guys here, or hey, there are the Mexican guys and the Asian kids or whatever. But it's just like when, when generally, I think one thing that's been said in the comment that was made was that, that Mexican Americans and African Americans and a lot of other minorities in the high in the high school don't feel that the school is really theirs. Mm -hmm. You get know what I'm saying? Exactly. Yeah, yeah I know what you And that mean. is yeah. one yeah. of the biggest issues that people have talked about. Why do Mexican Americans and African Americans yeah. not run for office? Because do they, like, do they? A lot of people are just like they don't feel that it's their high school. Yeah. And then I think mm -hmm. one issue that we haven't talked about is really important. I know this is kind of sidetrack. It's classism. It exists. It's it's kind of it's it's the issue that you know I always really never mention it, but it's really important because kids are put down. And the, if you were saying California is a really wealthy state, Davis is a really wealthy community, yes. and some people do not have the same amount of money and aren't as fortunate as others, and they're going to be put down for that. And in a way, it's like it's funny because I have some friends who were raised really poor, and because of things that have happened to them, are now like really well off. And it's the balance of that. And like the extremes that I've talked to them about is really sad because I never thought about it like that. And I never thought that, hey, well, the poor kids are being made fun of too. And classism, I think, is a big part of it because that's also kind of shows you like the black stereotype. All the black stereotypes are pretty much about being uneducated, being poor. Right. The Mexican stereotypes that are used are being about being uneducated, being poor. I think that's, that's a very a, big part of it. Yeah, you mentioned a very good topic that we are definitely going to do a follow-up show with, and that is classism, because that uh, 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 some people have also defined it as white privilege when yeah. it comes to David, and that's definitely an issue that we want to follow up with and have a show to discuss and have a, a, a large group, diverse group of students from the high school come and talk about it, maybe even the junior high. I saw you over here, Dwayne, uh, 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 shaking your head in agreement with Baba Jide. Uh, what what do you wish to to add to uh, to the comments that he was making? I saw you over there shaking yeah, your head. Yeah, definitely because I felt that way before. Mm -hmm. That the school is not yours. That was not mm -hmm. mine. It was. I really like. I I think it was until tenth, all tenth grade, all the way through tenth grade. I didn't feel like I just went to high school to take classes because I had to, but I didn't really feel like I was part of the school. I didn't really even try to go to the dances or anything because I didn't. I didn't feel part of the school because I felt like I wasn't even, nobody even tried to incorporate us mm -hmm. to it. So in, because your, your culture, your, your, your culture, the thing that you grew up with that identifies you, uh, being African, 
uh, being uh, Hispanic, Latina, that is not a part of the everyday discussion. So, exactly. So when you attend school, you're attending just to take your classes, get your grades, and then move on. And you aren't there to contribute and be a exactly. part of it. Is that because it feels like nobody even tries to really understand, like us, like as a community. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like for example, mm -hmm. I know like the whole uh, self segregation. I did that too because mm -hmm. when I moved here in eighth grade, I didn't. Everybody had no, no like knew each other from elementary school. Mm -hmm. So what was my first thing to do? Well, go with Mexicans, because mm -hmm. I can identify myself with That's them. That's what you felt comfortable with. I felt comfortable talking mm -hmm. to them, and they would, I, I hope they would help me out to really kind of just get the hang of the whole thing. Feel welcome. Yeah, yeah, but then the thing is that I realized that they themselves didn't really want to be part of the whole thing. They just kept with each other. And that was my, the problem that I had with that, the girl who was bullying me, she was, a, she was a Mexican girl. And she had a problem with me talking to other people from different races or even trying to do anything with school because she, she just didn't like that. Mm -hmm. And that's just really, really sad. And like I, like I said, not a lot of people try to, like right now I'm in student government, um, have a, a position or any or, and things like that. Not a lot of people do that. Very important position, might I add. You're a student, the student representative to the school board, and and a friendship day facilitator. That's fabulous. What what is it that that made you comfortable to say I want to do this? What 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 is it that happened that made you decide to go ahead and take that chance? Well, I think. I, I mean, just the fact that I felt that some people actually believed in me. Mm -hmm. Like there were certain teachers who would push me that would tell me, come on, you should try to do it. I mean, I know you can make a difference and prove to people that you're not just that like like stereotype that they're mm -hmm. giving to the Mexicans, that you can actually do something with your life. And it just made me think, yeah, you know, why should I be, why should I not be trying to enjoy what the well, school is offering mm -hmm. and become part of it? And that's like also through going through Friendship Day and really helped me open open my circle of friends and just talking to other people and just probably since my junior year, I've been looking at people for who they are and just not really thinking about races or anything else or religions or mm -hmm. whatever that is. I just, just accepting people. Accepting people. Yeah. yeah. It's just really hard to do for some people though. Yeah. That is wonderful. Um, boy, you both have shared just so much fabulous information, and it really sounds like with the discussions that have been going on, you both have learned a lot about yourselves and about others that you, you might have uh, otherwise not had a lot of communication with, which is good. And I really commend you on the, uh, you know, taking the leadership and, and participating in the dialogue. So I think that that's where the answer lies in the dialogue. You mentioned Babajide classism, and I know that's such a big issue, and we do mm. want to cover that in a future program. Have you experienced that? I, I ask you I that, have. but I also say that because I know that your answer is yes. I remember you mentioned it at the forum on the 24th. You experience, have. have experienced classism. Um, is that something you've experienced while attending school here? Or is that something you've just experienced as a whole? What, what can you say about that? I think I've almost experienced it, like through, probably starting through fifth grade mm -hmm. up till now, mm -hmm. and I still have. Just because, for example, in fifth, sixth grade, I used to live in Mexico, mm -hmm. but I attended a school of really millionaires, mm -hmm. just really rich people, and I didn't have as much money, and. People do kind of look down on you, but they don't really say it to your face, mm -hmm. you know? But then, I mean, it wasn't as obvious as when I came over here, and which was really sad is that I don't really get um, the whole classism issues with diff people from different ethnicities, but with the people of my own ethnicity. Uh -huh. okay. And the thing is, like, a lot of, like I said, a lot of Mexicans come here, like, who just trying to get like their parents come here because they don't have really good job opportunities over here and they're probably like don't have a lot of money and things like that and these people have grown up like that and they see me my dad with a PhD and he has a really good job and I think we're okay yeah I mean, so then they treat you differently because and of that. they treat me different just because of that 
And, I mean, it's hard because it just, they say, oh, yeah, you look at you, you have a house, you have a car, blah, blah, and we live in trailers. Yeah. Can I just, they themselves isolated me. Mm -hmm. And it was really hard for me for a while because I felt like I was isolated by the Mexican group. And in a way, I didn't, just didn't feel like I belonged to anything else right. because I, I didn't feel like I was accepted by anything else. Like, what else was I supposed to identify myself with? Yeah. And it's just really, really hard because just people just looking at you as, oh, yeah, you have money. Like, they're just labeling you as you're not like us. So then we can't be with you. No way. I'm being told that our show's about to wrap up here, but... I do want to commend you both again. You're doing outstanding work, both of you. It takes courage and leadership to, um, to come forth and say, there is a problem and we need to talk about it as a school, as a community. And you both have done that. And I, I commend you both. You both are outstanding, outstanding. Not just outstanding youth, but outstanding human beings. And this discussion is going to continue because it's a discussion that has needed to take place for quite some time, for quite some time. And uh, I ask you, I'm going to ask you both to, to continue to help me and help others in the community uh, continue with the dialogue so that we can come up with solutions. I want to thank you both for joining us here this evening in the studio. And uh, I want to thank you, the viewing audience, for joining us today uh, on Student Speak Out. And uh, please be sure to, to stay tuned and, uh, uh, you know, look both in the newspaper and on the schedule for DCTV because we are going to have upcoming discussions on this very topic. Have a good night. I'm your host, Cecilia Escamilla Greenwald. Thank you. Thank you both so much. Thank you. Appreciate it.